So, uh, my name is Sanjay Bielski. Uh, I work for LucidWorks. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer. Uh, I work on the solar team at LucidWorks. Uh, and uh, I'm also on uh, a Lucin and Solar committer and PMC member. Uh, some of my past projects uh, that involved Lucene, uh, maybe, uh, maybe you know them. Uh, uh, for instance, I created this Look uh, uh, Lucene Index uh, Toolbox uh, utility that you can use to examine Lucene indexes. And more recently, I was involved in adding uh, the metrics subsystem to Solar. And uh, for the past year, I've, uh, I've been focused on, uh, on uh, implementing parts of the autoscaling framework. And that's uh, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, about the cluster dynamics in, auto, in solar autoscaling. Uh, and I will also explain uh, and show you how I index one trillion documents uh, and how I survived this experience. Uh, that's not a mistake, that's one with 12 zeros. So first, uh, uh, brief recap what uh, solar autoscaling is. Solar autoscaling is a monitoring and control framework. It's basically a framework that uh, makes sure that uh, your system is stable uh, and uh, cluster resources are used uh, uh, in an optimal way. So it uses, uh, for this purpose, it uses uh, policy uh, definition, uh, which is basically a set of rules and preferences uh, that define how, where to place repli replicas uh, on which nodes and uh, uh, which amounts of replicas on, on, on what node. It also monitors nodes and replicas uh, and detects uh, uh, changes in, in cluster state, uh, such as lost nodes or lost re replicas or overloaded uh, uh, nodes, and it suggests uh, uh, actions uh, to perform to resolve these violations. And if you define appropriate triggers, uh, uh, then it can automatically actually take these actions and move around replicas uh, and uh, uh, Ba ba bring balance back to the cluster. Uh, it can also execute other actions, uh, uh, such as, uh, for example, splitting shards if their size is too large. Or in the future, in the near future, I hope, uh, it can also merge shards if their size is too small. So in order to perform all of that, uh, there are several components involved. Um, the main component is a trigger definition. and. Uh, uh, the, there are several types of triggers. Uh, each reacts uh, to a different type of events, uh, uh, like, for example, node lost, node added, uh, search rate exceeded, uh, or any other arbitrary metrics value exceeded, uh, um, etc. And uh, when this happens, trigger generates an event. And this event uh, is then processed by trigger actions. And most commonly used trigger actions uh, are the compute plan action, which computes uh, the uh, collection level commands or op collection operations that need to be done. For example, move replica from node A to node B because uh, that node is unstable or is overloaded or split shot because it's too large. And the other commonly used action is execute plan action, which actually executes these commands. So the expected result of, uh, uh, of uh, auto-scaling framework in action is that your cluster is stable, well-balanced, resources are, are properly allocated, and everything uh, runs uh, within desired parameters. So we have this uh, dream of, uh, that I call the well-tempered cluster, uh, right? Uh, we start small, uh, maybe with two or three or five nodes, uh, whatnot, and uh, as we keep adding uh, more and more data, we keep adding nodes, we keep adding replicas, and our auto-scaling framework uh, allocates these replicas, etc., and everything uh, works uh, pretty fine, and uh, at some point in, in the bright future, we reach this magic number of one, tri one trillion documents, or even slightly more here. Uh, this, of course, is a myth. Uh, because in re the reality is much more complicated, and autoscaling can solve only part of these problems, and, but there are some inherent limitations, uh, things that it simply cannot do. So, uh, Autoscaling can manage uh, fixing some catastrophic errors, uh, such as node lost, uh, or, or replica lost, or node overloaded, or shard size too large, etc. But uh, there is a certain class of phenomena uh, that occur in large clusters. Uh, so we call them weird behaviors. Uh, situation changes dynamically, and then either it stabilizes, and everyone is happy, or it doesn't. 
So autoscaling can manage uh, these situations, but uh, there are certain limits. First limit is uh, that there is a design limitation in autoscaling. Autoscaling is a control framework and not an optimization framework. This distinction is very important uh, uh, because autoscaling controls only the, the current behavior. It only looks at a very short time, uh, time frame uh, to, uh, to determine what actions it needs to, it's, it needs, it needs to take. So it does not anticipate long-term uh, trends and it doesn't, doesn't know anything about external context. If your external context is that uh, there's an upcoming holiday, well, you may want to add more replicas, but autoscaling doesn't know that. So that's the task for the optimization framework, which is conveniently not implemented in solar. Uh, you have to do it yourself. Either you put uh, some human bodies uh, that uh, you know, know that, uh, okay, we, next week we'll have a holiday, so we need to prepare for that. Or you need to uh, implement it as some other you know, optimization controller, but that's out of the scope of the autoscaling framework. But that optimization can use autoscaling mechanism to enact its optimizations. There are also certain practical uh, uh, autoscaling limits. Size matters, obviously. Uh, even such a trivial aspect as uh, uh, log analysis and log collection. Uh, if you have 10 nodes, it's quite manageable. But if you have uh, 1,000 nodes, it becomes very less manageable. Uh, probably exponentially so. So this, uh, this dependency on size uh, may not be linear. Time matters, obviously, uh, but uh, in uh, uh, non-obvious ways sometimes, uh, and uh, that's the point that uh, I'm going to elaborate on uh, in a moment. And finally, budget matters. If your autoscaling framework suggests to you that uh, you should allocate uh, 1,000 nodes, that's probably not a practical suggestion, right? You may want to re rethink that, or otherwise you will have a tough discussion with your manager. There are also some theoretical limits uh, to autoscaling. Uh, even if you react immediately, your reaction is too, already too late. Uh, there is no such thing as immediate reaction. Uh, this exists only on paper. In reality, uh, reactions take some time, and effects of these reactions also take time. So even immediate reaction is always too late. There are information limits. Basically, we don't know anything uh, with, with, uh, with certainty. Uh, we, our, our knowledge is always partial and uh, probably out of date by the time uh, we collect all the bits of, data, bits of information. So in order to mitigate this, we use approximations, sampling, and estimations. But all of these uh, aspects introduce errors. There are also complexity limits. Uh, we have this mental model how the autoscaling should work, and we put it in, in the code. But the reality is, of course, much, much more complex. And our model will never approach the complexity of the real thing because then it would become the real thing. So these simpli simplifications also introduce errors. And autoscaling has to deal with these limitations. So it often helps to analyze the behavior of your cluster uh, under these, looking at it from these two aspects, uh, considering static behavior separately from the dynamic behavior. So the static behavior uh, is a steady state response to some change that you introduced. Let's say that you want to increase your maximum search uh, rate, uh, ma maximum search throughput. So the answer to that is to add more replicas. So as you add more replicas, they need to recover, etc. So there is a, some transient uh, state, right? But you wait until everything stabilizes, and then you measure the actual increase in the throughput. So that's the steady response. In many cases, it's more or less linear, in some range. Uh, we call this the operating range. Outside of this range, anything goes. I mean, it could increase, uh, or it could decrease, uh, or it could just crash everything. So you want to stay within this operating range. So that's how you uh, uh, analyze the static behavior of the system. But there is the, the second, uh, sometimes even more important aspect, the dynamic behavior. How does the system react to changes over time? and how quickly the cluster reaches equilibrium, equil equilibrium after you introduce a change, and whether it reaches that state, that state at all. So if you multiply this by the n parameters that you can tweak, uh, 
uh, the thing may appear hopeless, hopelessly complex. Is there any way to analyze this? Well, there is a, um, there is a discipline that can help us to, un to better understand this dynamic aspect. It's called control theory. And uh, even if you don't know the name, you're probably, more, you're probably already familiar with the concept of a feedback loop. Uh, there are basically two uh, loops or two uh, models for controlling a process. Uh, either it's an open uh, loop where uh, your control input uh, directly impacts uh, the process and uh, you don't care what the output is because uh, you more or less know you have a very good model of what the output is. That's a very rare case. In most cases in reality, the uh, situation is much more complex and there are some di external disturbances that can affect the output of the process. So we use feedback loops and feedback loops uh, are a very uh, popular way to solve uh, these uh, control issues, control, control challenges. And uh, they're actually omnipresent, present in every area of life. Uh, you can see feedback loops in biology, uh, in economy, uh, in uh, mechanics, in physics, and of course in computer science. So in, in practice, uh, in any given system, there are multiple feedback loops, uh, each controlling each own parameter. And uh, in most cases, if you control one parameter, it affects other parameters too. What to do about it, we'll look at it in a moment. So let's picture auto-scaling framework as a series of feedback loops, where each feedback loop is a trigger definition and its actions and the changes that, uh, that, that it introduces in, in a solar cluster. So initially we have our desired state, uh, which is uh, perhaps uh, the search rate limits. We feed this uh, information uh, to the autoscaling controller, which is our trigger definition, so that it knows uh, what kind of uh, search throughput is expected. And then it knows, okay, yeah, maybe uh, I need to add uh, one or two more replicas. And then it uh, uh, executes this uh, change, uh, changes the, uh, the layout of the cluster, which causes a measurable change in the real state. And we measure this using metrics and cluster state. Uh, you can note that uh, uh, we, ha we, we have uh, disturbances coming in to the, into the system. Uh, the most important ones are search and indexing traffics and faults. So they affect the real state, which is the real uh, search rate that we are trying to achieve. Then we measure this real state uh, and we use metrics, which uh, are again the averaged and sampled, uh, so they introduce some measurement errors. And they are, of, uh, of course, delayed. And this is our observed state, which we feed back to the trigger. And the trigger compares observed state and the desired state, and based on that, it nudges the, uh, the controls in the right directions, maybe adding one more replica or removing two replicas. So the, the important point here is uh, the one at the bottom. Desired state never equals real state and never equals observed state, and this repeats for n loops. So these are the challenges for the auto-scaling feedback loops. Uh, first, we have the delay. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, no action brings immediate effects. Uh, it always takes time before uh, effects uh, appear, right? It takes time to move data around. It takes time to spin up a new node or to add a replica and have, have it uh, become online, etc. So this uh, is related also to the lag, uh, which means that even if we add the 10 replicas in one go, uh, it will still take time. I mean, one replica becomes active, but then uh, another two or three become active, etc. And finally, we have measurement errors because we are only sampling uh, these average metrics. So that's uh, why we don't have a nice smooth curve here, this black curve. Uh, it's, it's a staircase because we only sample at given uh, time intervals. So all of this introduces uh, errors and delays. And uh, the problem is that the controller, uh, which is our trigger, may want to fix uh, or may try to fix something that is out of date and approximate, no longer true. What is the impact of uh, these delays on a, on a feedback loop? 
Uh, this is a simulation that, that, that I did in, uh, in the Open Modelica uh, environment. And it simply illustrates a, a controller uh, that, uh, well, the, the input value is this very, very faint green line. Uh, uh, that's our desired state. And the actual output uh, from the process is the red line. So if the delay is very short, uh, the controller is able to, to track this uh, desired value pretty closely. But as the delay grows, you can see that the controller has no information for a certain time, and then it realizes, oops, I, I should have added two replicas more. Oh, then let's add four, just to be sure, right? And it overcompensates. And then it realizes, oops, I overcompensated. Oh, by that much, then I will remove eight replicas. Wow. So as the delay grows and, uh, and grows, this, this situation becomes worse and worse until uh, it, re it results in a complete chaos. Your controller that was supposed to stabilize the system uh, contributed to a complete instability and chaos. So there are certain inherent delays in autoscaling that we need to be aware of. Uh, there are several of them. Uh, you will get the slides uh, uh, afterwards. So I, I, I'm not going to go through every one of them. But the most important ones are replica movement and recovery. Uh, these, uh, depending on the size of your data, they, they can take uh, either from several seconds up to several minutes. If you have a like a 100 gigabyte uh, large shard, which is not recommended, but it may happen, uh, then it uh, takes time to move uh, the data that belongs to this replica to another node. It may take uh, several minutes, depending on the, uh, on the network I.O., the, uh, the load on each node, et cetera, et cetera. So we have basically two options in autoscaling. Either these triggers, these controllers, have to uh, have you know, prophetic powers and uh, uh, con correctly anticipate future state, which is generally very hard. Uh, <laughs> Or we have to wait some time until our measurements uh, reflect reality uh, to, a, to a larger degree, which is quite easy. So guess which, which option we picked. We simply wait longer to increase the stability of this uh, feedback loop. And the parameter in the, in the trigger configuration that, uh, uh, that defines this is called wait for. Uh, this is the parameter that all triggers support, and it uh, defines uh, how long to wait for the consistent violation of a specified threshold. And the important uh, keyword here is consistent because uh, the wait for does not uh, uh, react uh, for inconsistent, uh, intermittent uh, violations. It waits until the threshold is uh, violated consistently for the wait for, wait for period. And only then it generates the event that reports violation. So the important aspect is how to tune this uh, wait for parameter. Uh, intuitively, we know that uh, it cannot be too long because if it's too long, then the violation will last too long. And this, this here is our upper threshold and this here is uh, our lower threshold that we define. And this here is a measured uh, metric that we, we try to stabilize. So if we wait too long, then this maximum value of the violation grow, grows, right? And this in itself can cause catastrophic errors. So wait for cannot be too long. On the other hand, it cannot be too short, and I uh, will show you in a second. So we picked a value, and then uh, it takes some time, some time for the event processing to complete. And again, it takes some time, maybe up to minutes, uh, for the results of these actions to actually take effect. So if you added 10 replicas, and each of your replicas uh, has uh, 50 gigabytes uh, of data, it will take time to propagate this data uh, and uh, for the replicas to recover. And it's a non-zero time. So we see that uh, the controller took some action here, right? Uh, it, for example, it, it added replicas. And after a while, we see that the situation goes back to normal uh, through the intermittent uh, state and back to normal. And if this process fits within the wait for period, we don't generate any new event because the situation stabilized, right? Uh, 
What happens if we, uh, well, we can be tempted to, to uh, shorten this wait for uh, period, right? Because we may think that, okay, if we make it uh, very short, then the system will react quickly and I will not get uh, any violations, right? So it will track very closely and I will always fit uh, within these, uh, between these upper and, and lower thresholds. Well, it's not exactly so. Uh, you see, here we had uh, the violation, right? Because the metric uh, went above the threshold. And we waited very, uh, very shortly here and we generated the event. But before the event was completely processed and uh, replicas recovered, our wait for is again too short. So we think that uh, the, the direction of this violation is, uh, still goes on, right? Uh, that the situation becomes worse and worse. Whereas we already took corrective actions that will bring this uh, metric back to the, to, the, to the operating range. But the trigger didn't know that because uh, it didn't want to wait in long enough. So it issues another request, et cetera, et cetera, and it overcompensates. So uh, our metric falls down, it actually falls off the screen. Uh, and again, suddenly the controller realizes, uh, oh, well, I overcompensated, so let's overcompensate in the other direction. And you see, instead of increased stability, you may introduce instability. So it's understanding to, uh, so, so it's important to understand the, uh, these uh, time scales uh, that are involved, that the wait for parameter should uh, be set always to a, a larger value than the recovery time. Otherwise it doesn't make sense because uh, it, it's a, it, it tells the trigger that I don't want to wait for the system to recover uh, before I make uh, more changes. So you see these two extremes. If you have too long wait for uh, parameter, then uh, you get more serious violations of these uh, thresholds and, and the return to balance is slower, but you have overall greater stability because the, the, uh, the trigger doesn't overcompensate. If it's too short, uh, then it uh, reacts reacts uh, more quickly, but you have a higher risk of instability. So at this point you may wonder, uh, well, uh, yeah, this is, um, this is cool, but uh, I need to test it, right? <laughs> and uh, I would like to test it uh, for my you know, future scenario of uh, 500 nodes, but I don't have 500 nodes ready uh, at the moment. Well, in the meantime, you can learn a lot by examining uh, the, uh, the output of the auto-scaling uh, diagnostic and suggestions reports. There are two API endpoints that you should examine frequently, and I believe my colleague uh, Baron will talk about this uh, in the next session. I don't know whether it's here or elsewhere. Um, so setting up these large clusters is quite costly, and uh, uh, testing these repeatable scenarios is also quite difficult be because you cannot easily reset this cluster. What if we use the fake cluster instead? So that's how the autoscaling simulation was born. Uh, the, simulation, the simulation framework uses actual autoscaling code. So uh, we refactored this code uh, so we could uh, uh, use either MOX or, or the simulator. It supports testing very large clusters, uh, like thousands of nodes, thousands of replicas, uh, and thousands of collections. Well, I put hundreds, but thousands. It supports also using accelerated time. Uh, so we can run things uh, like 100 times faster uh, than in rea reality, which means that you can test more scenarios. And it supports uh, testing repeatable scenarios because you can uh, uh, use its API to actually set the values of the metrics that affect the, how, the, how the triggers uh, react. And this framework is available since Solar 7.3 in core tests. Uh, we should probably improve this uh, to make it easier to set up these uh, test scenarios because currently you need to write uh, pieces of Java code to set up a scenario. So that's exactly how I was able to index one trillion documents. I set up a, a simulator with 500 nodes and I used index size trigger uh, to keep the uh, uh, shard size uh, at uh, 50 million documents and then I kept adding documents. And uh, I kept indexing uh, using this uh, 250K batches. And after a few hours, 
I got this result. And uh, what is what is the nice thing about this is that uh, the all the all the uh, rules for, for replica placements on these 500 nodes uh, acted beautifully. Uh, I got very well balanced cluster, and uh, replicas had the correct sizes, and uh, everything seemed to work quite okay, with the exceptions of a few issues. So that's how we discovered the impact of the weight for on cluster stability. Uh, it was much less painful discovery uh, uh, as compared to, uh, to testing this on, on a real cluster. We discovered also several other interesting scenarios. Uh, uh, I will, uh, maybe I will explain uh, just the first one. Flaky node scenario is when, uh, when you have a node that intermittently uh, goes up and down, up and down, up and down, uh, for unknown reasons. And uh, the period, period of these changes is uh, shorter than wait for. And as I explained uh, uh, before, if it doesn't consistently violate the threshold uh, uh, during the wait for period, we don't report this event. So this state uh, wasn't reported, and eventually uh, the, the, the node died. But uh, until it died, uh, many, many of the operations, uh, requests, uh, indexing, and search requests would uh, time out mysteriously or uh, you know, resulted in errors. There are some other issues that are reported in JIRA, so we can read more about this. And all of them were discovered using this simulation framework. Specifically for the shard splitting, um, we realized that after a while, uh, shard names and replica names become really awkward. So that's a, that's a replica name at the 10th level of split, right? So when we have uh, uh, 1,024 uh, uh, replicas, uh, sorry, sorry, shards. Uh, we've discovered also several other uh, interesting uh, bugs uh, or Hmm. suboptimal uh, 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 issues. Uh, uh, for example, we realized that uh, if we split uh, shards exactly evenly uh, into two parts or into n parts, as was recently added, uh, then after a while, if the total number of documents reaches the multiple, then we'll get multiple split shard requests simultaneously. So if the number of shards is large, then we'll get like 2,000 split shard requests at the same time, which uh, crashed over here. So, so uh, we realized that uh, we, uh, we, sh we probably should not, at certain points, uh, we, we probably should not split shards exactly in half. We should uh, probably uh, uh, do a fuzzy splitting and uh, m move around this uh, boundary by one or two percent. Um, there are other, other issues that are described in JIRA. So, uh, let me just uh, mention that uh, Solar 7.5 supports a, a new uh, split shard mode, which is uh, vastly more efficient than the old methods. And it, you can select it by, by using this uh, Solar parameter, split method link. Obviously, there are many, many more to-dos uh, uh, in the auto-scaling. We would like to reduce delays in these feedback loops. Um, mm, and uh, to do so, uh, we would like to implement parallel execution of collection actions in execute plan action. Uh, there are probably some other uh, gains uh, that we can have in, in, in how, we, uh, how we execute these, uh, these operations. We would like to also implement rudimentary trend tracking in some triggers, uh, some form of PID control. And we want to improve uh, this fine-grained feedback control uh, at a lower level, like at a solar core level, uh, or even request processing level. And we also want to provide solid support uh, for third-party extensions uh, uh, for this external optimization framework that I mentioned before. So we are thinking of introducing scripted triggers, scripted actions, and listeners. So to summarize, auto-scaling already helps a lot. And it's already well-supported. And uh, if you use uh, any of the... 7.x releases, uh, auto-scaling can help you a lot. But uh, you cannot ignore these dynamic aspects of auto-scaling. And uh, in order to, to understand them better, uh, you can use this mental model of a feedback loop. 
and uh, you can use uh, you can read some literature on, about this how the delays uh, how to mitigate delays how to improve the controllers which is our trigger implementations to to better uh, uh, stabilize uh, the, feed, the feedback loop and we've seen that uh, the auto scaling can be tuned uh, using this wait for parameter for slower but more stable control and in order to test uh, whether your scenario is viable uh, using large number of nodes and large number of replicas, we can use the simulation framework. Certain, certainly, uh, this is an exciting uh, 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 aspect of, uh, of solar, still under active development. Uh, so there are uh, many more improvements uh, to be done. And I encourage you to, uh, to contribute to, to, this, uh, to this area of solar, either by code or by uh, actually testing it on, uh, in your, hopefully, testing clusters and not the production clusters. So uh, that's all I had to say. Uh, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>